welcome tonight to how Medicare reimbursement influences therapy, specifically in post-acute care. Uh, so this is going to be kind of a historical look back at some of the reimbursement models and how they've changed and how that kind of relates to even some of the things that we're feeling today in healthcare and how reimbursement has impacted the way that we provide care today. So I'm Clarice Grody, right? I'm an occupational therapist and health policy consultant. I'm also the founder and CEO of Amplify OT. Um, so my advocacy background is that I'm the former director of practice for the Missouri Occupational Therapy Association. I'm also the former advocacy and policy coordinator for AOTA um, for their home and community health special interest section. Um, there's my contact information, and then I'm also the incoming co-chair uh, for the North Carolina OT Association for their advocacy committee. So excited for that new adventure. So I like to start this presentation with a quote from one of my favorite articles that I found from 1991 in AJOT, American Journal of Occupational Therapy, titled, How High Do We Jump? It was written by Brenda Howard. Uh, so this is back in the 1990s when uh, reimbursement was really starting to change. And I like this quote because I think it reflects well with even what we might relate to today. So it says, the current environment of cost containment leaves occupational therapists, quote, caught between the pressures of patients' demands for quality care and the drive to contain costs, which creates professional and emotional conflict. And even though this quote is from 1991, I think it's definitely a quote that still resonates even with us today in 2023, that we often really feel caught in this tough situation between how do we provide quality how do we still, you know, relate to reimbursement? How does that influence occupational therapy and what we do? Um, so definitely something that I think still heavily impacts how we think about care um, and shows that we are definitely not alone in feeling that today. So to kind of talk about how some things have changed, it's always good to kind of talk a little bit about value-based care and lay some of the base ground of reimburser or some of the major players that we have in reimbursement. So we have health and human services, right? Or HHS, which is the department of the government. Underneath HHS, we have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, who we're primarily going to be talking about today. And we also have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMMI, which is also kind of recently somewhat rebranded to the CMS Innovation Center. Then as part of a big player in value-based care and quality measurement, we have Battelle. So Battelle is actually the new CMS quality contract that replaced the National Quality Forum. So up until recently, the National Quality Forum has been heavily involved in developing quality measurement and endorsing quality measures that CMS and utilizes throughout their quality reporting programs. Um, but now that contract is transferred to Battelle that took over Sometime in spring of this year, 2023, it's still something that is transitioning, uh, but Battelle, as well as the National Quality Forum, they're nonpartisan, um, nonprofit organizations that are consensus-based. So it's this idea that uh, we have a committee of individuals who come together, AOTA is part of some of those committees to discuss the quality measures and agree on whether or not they are something that should be endorsed or supported, um, whether or not they're really necessary for care. So Battelle uh, now has a role in that. So obviously the development of quality measures is really important when looking at value-based care. So before we kind of had value-based care, we had more volume-based care. So this cost-based reimbursement. And what value-based care is not um, is this emphasis on high quantity of care. So volume really incentivizes providing lots of therapy, uh, lots of services to make more money. Uh, it's not driven by patient needs or outcomes. It's really focused on just providing the most care all the time. Maybe it's right, but so this is where, you know, your doctor would order a slew of tests and x-ray as well as an MRI and then multiple different services or for therapy, we're just incentivized to provide lots of different, lots of services um, versus really trying to think about if we're providing high quality or a value. Uh, Volume-based care is primarily fee-for-service models. So, right, the idea that the more you provide, the more money that you make. Uh, in the therapy world, we really saw this like in rug levels is a great, great example of volume-based care. Also therapy thresholds that we used to have under um, before PDGM and home health. And then Medicare Part B is still our primary uh, fee-for-service model. So it's still our most uh, value-based volume -based care setting is Medicare Part B. Uh, it also incentivizes that higher quantity um, and promotes utilization of the most expensive services. So instead of maybe trying therapy first, we might jump more to surgery or to other expensive tests um, versus under value-based care, it really tries to incentivize trying potentially the cheaper but still effective option, um, which can be a great place for therapy because we can be a lot less um, expensive than some surgical interventions. Uh, 
but uh, under vo volume-based care is really just promoting providing a lot of care. Also to set our baseline, we'll review Medicare quickly. So Medicare right, is our only publicly available national health insurance program. There are other national health insurance programs like TRICARE or the VA, but they aren't publicly available like Medicare is. Um, it's available to people over the age of 65, those with end-stage renal disease or those with a disability. Medicare Part A is our traditional or hospital insurance. It's generally free to individuals as long as they've paid into Medicare the appropriate length of time. Um, it covers inpatient hospital stays, inpatient rehab facilities, LTAC, SNF, and home health. Medicare Part B is our outpatient insurance. Uh, so this is one that typically has a monthly premium that's based on income. So depending on how much money someone makes depends on how much they pay per month for Medicare Part B. Uh, it is technically optional but most people do have it. It covers observation hospital stays, durable medical equipment, outpatient therapy, and outpatient visits. Uh, so there are still, you know, skilled nursing facilities can still bill Medicare Part B, but usually under that outpatient therapy umbrella. Medicare Part D, pretty simple, right? D equals drugs, so it covers your prescription drugs. And then Medicare Part C is also known as Medicare Advantage. Uh, now, it's estimated that approximately 48% of Medicare-eligible beneficiaries are enrolled in Advantage plans, so they're very prevalent, and I believe um, as recently that they predict that it's over 50%, either now or will be within the next year or so. Um, so Medicare Advantage plans are very popular. Uh, what's difficult about them is that they're run by private health insurance companies. So once you've seen one Medicare Advantage plan, you've seen that one Medicare Advantage plan. So what I'll be talking about today applies to Medicare, so traditional Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B. Well, some of the Pair Advantage plans, it's hard to say because um, they make, get to make their own decisions on how they spend their dollars as long as they cover at least the minimum of what Medicare covers, um, but they can also institute prior authorizations and all sorts of things. Um, so they may or may not follow all of Medicare policies. All right, so to rewind into the 1990s, um, CMS is starting to kind of pay attention to costs and outcomes, right? The cost of healthcare has really started to rise to get out of control, and they're starting to think about, okay, how do we actually know that the care that's being provided is safe, that it's effective, it's useful, that it's worth all the money? So approximately 20% of all Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries received hospital care in, I believe it's supposed to be 1999. 25% um, of those patients received post-acute care services. So um, it was only about a quarter of them that actually went to PAC. Home health was the most common post-acute care service. And one out of every 10 beneficiaries received an average of 73 visits per year. So if you think about home health as we know it today and getting 73 visits per year, that would be quite a few. Um, so the fact that one in 10 beneficiaries were receiving an average of 73 visits per year is pretty high. Um, so home health no longer looks like that now. Um, the average visits we'll talk about in every 30 days is significantly lower. So um, just thinking about how much different some of these settings looked. Therapy charges were really going quickly. Um, this is something that they were starting to pay a lot of attention to because it was one of the fastest growing expenses, especially in post-acute care, like skilled nursing facilities and home health. So between 1990 and 1996, skilled nursing facility spending increased from 25.1 million to 40.2 million, so nearly doubling. Um, therapy use did double. Essentially, so it went from being 15% of those charges to 29% of those charges. So therapy utilization was really increasing these settings. Um, but the one thing that these numbers don't include is Medicare Part B services. So they anticipate that these numbers were even actually pretty sufficiently underestimated because this was only looking at Medicare Part A versus it was a lot more common than to kind of provide Medicare Part B in addition to some of their Part A services because they weren't very well regulated. Um, home health care between 1990 and 1996 increased from $1.9 million to $3.7 million uh, average of spending with an average of 36 to 77 visits per year. So um, one in 10 received 73 visits per year, but that general average across the board was 36 to 77. So still quite a bit of therapy in terms of quantity. And these episodes were lasting, so episodes lasting longer than 165 days also grew by 43%. And that made up 20% of all episodes. So pretty much one in five episodes was longer than 165 days, which that is well over, you know, the kind of normal three months or things like that. Like now we're lucky, if, right? If we get to see patients for 30 to 60 days, imagine seeing them for 165, we're talking pretty much over a third of the year. 
Uh, so that's a very long length of care in which you can see why spending was increasing so rapidly. Now, this was coming from a article on, um, this is actually from the Office of Inspector General. Um, I forgot to update this citation, but it's from the Office of Inspector General in the 1990s, um, where they were reviewing skilled nursing facilities in California. They looked at 24 SNFs nation, um, so there were 24 SNFs nationwide and 218 Medicare um, patients. And the quote was that the implementation of a prospective payment system for Medicare Part A beneficiaries and a $1,500 cap on therapy services for Part B beneficiaries creates an appropriate structure to control the cost of therapy services. And then they express at the same time that they believe the cost formula is being used to develop the prospective payment system and Part B cap could also be significantly compromised by the volume of medically unnecessary services. So through these studies, they found that there was a lot of unnecessary therapy that was being provided in the skilled nursing facilities. And through these audits, um, they were identifying that a lot of it was due to poor documentation, that it was overutilization of therapy services, that they just weren't medically appropriate for individuals. Um, there was one patient that they talked about that had advanced dementia and delirium, and he was being provided with five hours of therapy a day. Um, that obviously was then not medically necessary, if anything, harmful. So you can see kind of where their head was at, that they really felt that therapy was something that they needed to control. So Medicare and Congress, right, about this time is starting to pay attention. They're starting to really think about, okay, how much this service is costing? They'd already been implemented in the hospitals, the diagnostic-related groups. That was implemented sometime in the 80s to try and start controlling costs. And so it was in the 90s that they started paying attention to post-acute care. So we saw the passage of a bipartisan budget or a balanced budget act that required the implementation of the therapy cap on Part B services, and that was implemented in 1999. So they had that $1,500 cap um, on Medicare Part B. Uh, many of the clinicians who are working this, this during this time talk about how they were laid off, um, that overnight they had lost their job because everyone was so concerned right, about the spending um, and how that cap would influence. So that was a hard cap that over you could not provide over $1,500 of therapy and Medicare would not cover that. So that was a way that they were trying to control those costs. Um, they also had simultaneous introduction of the prospective payment system at the same time. So these were their new payment models. They were moving away from that cost-based reimbursement. So basically just paying the facilities for whatever they were billing for and move towards models that were more similar to the DRGs that had already been implemented in the hospitals. Another reason why post-acute care spending was really increasing is that hospitals were kind of starting to buy up as well. Post-acute care facilities as a way to um, increase their revenue since they'd already had some kind of caps put in with DRGs. They were trying to then um, make more money by buying post-acute care facilities. So they implemented uh, PPS and SNFs with, along with the MDS in 1998. They implemented it in home health with the OASIS in 2000. In inpatient rehab, they had the IRF Pi in 2002, and then also implemented it in ILTAC as well in 2002. So we did not even have these standardized assessments really um, until the late 1990s, early 2000s. So if you think about that in terms of the grand scheme of healthcare and the fact that Medicare is implemented in 1965, the fact that it took you know 40 years before we actually start thinking about, okay, how are we going to collect this data and standardize care? Um, and healthcare is really interesting and how far we've come even in the last you know 23 years. So all of this is still, you know, in the grand scheme of healthcare, a fairly new experiment. So along with that, we finally start to see right toward back towards that rise of value-based care. So in 2007, we had the implementation of the triple aim or the discussion of the triple aim. So this is one of those first major, major moves towards value-based care. It was first developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in 2007, and it was founded on pursuing these three pillars at the same time. So while they'd been considered separately, this was the first time that they really started talking about doing all three at the same time, which was improving patient health reducing per capita cost of care, so the cost of care for each person, and improving the quality of care and patient experience. So like we said, there'd already been kind of looking at, okay, how can we improve population health or how can we reduce per capita costs? But they hadn't thought about how they can do those at the same time. 
The triple aim really kind of led in towards discussions and considerations. Then we saw the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare pass in 2010. So Obamacare really implemented some of those elements of the triple aim and kind of forced um, the government's hand in terms of moving more towards, again, value-based care and re redoing a lot of the payment structures. Uh, so it passed in 2010 and improved healthcare coverage, especially around chronic disease management. Uh, it also required the implementation of CMMI, or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and also required essential health benefits, which occupational therapy is one of those essential health benefits. Then in 2014, oh, we saw the triple aim revised into the quadruple aim. Uh, they added one more pillar to this, so we still have reducing costs, we still have improving population health and patient experience, but then we've also added in that healthcare team well-being. So even before the most recent pandemic, they were still starting to pay attention to how exactly healthcare well-being and what, how important it is in terms of sustaining a high-quality healthcare system. So what are the goals of value-based care, right? We reviewed some of the goals of volume-based, so here are the goals of value. Um, it's all about providing the right care at the right time and also to the right patient. So you'll often hear either these two at the same time or all three, right care to the right time to the right patient. Um, focusing really on better outcomes and decreasing spending so that cost effectiveness, looking at whether or not the service you're providing outweighs the cost. Overall, trying to improve patient experience. More care does not always equal better. Focusing on the idea that patient needs should be driving care, um, really trying to improve communication between providers, right? So again, reducing some of those repetitive services by improving communication. So that way you don't go to your primary care doctor, they run a series of tests. And then a few days later, you go to cardiologists and they run a few more, right? Trying to make sure that those physicians are communicating or even therapy is communicating between clinicians, right? Um, also trying to focus on improving health equity and health equality. Uh, so overall, trying to find that balance between value and affordability. And of course, it's always going to be that balance. It's always trying to figure out where is that sweet spot. Because if we cut costs, if we cut spending so much, then we're also going to see that decrease in value, right? You can't just completely cut care. And at the same time, sometimes if you provide more care, the quality doesn't always rise at the same time with it. So really trying to find where that sweet spot is, and it's still, it's always going to be an experiment of where can we both have better quality of care or at least the same while still reducing the amount that we're spending. Because we know here in the U.S., we have some of the highest healthcare costs in the world, but not necessarily some of the best outcomes. So how is CMS thinking about quality? Well, they have established numerous initiatives to work towards these value-based care goals, um, the first of which was creating the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which we'll talk about next. Uh, they're also phasing out fee-for-service payment models. So they've already been making progress towards this, of transitioning towards value-based payment models. Um, CMS did mention at a conference a couple of years ago that they plan to eliminate all fee-for-service models at some point, um, but they have quite a bit of work left to do towards that goal. Obviously, we are still predominantly in a fee-for-service area, even our current value-based payment models do still have those fee-for-service elements, so they still have a lot of work to do, but those are things to be thinking about as our healthcare looks to change. They've also introduced the Patients Over Paperwork Initiative, so this was a goal of looking at how can they reduce burden, improve efficiencies in care, and improve the patient experience. So one of the main ways that Patients Over Paperwork helped occupational therapy um, is that we used to have to collect G-codes, so you'd have to report the G-codes, um, but CMS did an audit of their documentation and found that they were collecting all these data through G-codes, but then nothing was being done with it. It wasn't going to quality measures. It wasn't going towards payment. It wasn't really capturing good information on how a patient was performing. And so they eliminated the requirement to report on those G-codes. So that's an example of a time where patients over paperwork has impacted therapy. And it's still something that AOTA and other associations use in their advocacy um, to try and reduce that paperwork burden and make sure that it's really effective. And they also have meaningful measures, which is pretty similar to the patients over paperwork. They're looking to identify the highest priority for quality measurement and improvement. So making sure that the measures they're using are meaningful um, and really kind of trying to cut down again on the number of quality measures, because sometimes having so many quality measures, you're just collecting a lot of data, but then you're not even able to respond to it. And it ends up just being a time and uh, financial burden on the facilities reporting it. So really looking at are the quality measures that they have useful? Are they measuring what they're supposed to? And if not, can we eliminate them? 
The quality reporting program is again, something we're gonna get into here in a bit, um, but this was, uh, the quality reporting program is basically what they call their current quality program, generally, so the QRP. So when they establish what quality measures they want um, facilities to submit, it's underneath their quality reporting program. And that's where you're gonna find information on what, what the quality measures are that are currently utilized. They've also developed financial incentives to reward adopting best practices. So one of the most common ones that we see in PAC is value-based purchasing programs. So right, this idea of using money to incentivize people to provide better care. So under value-based purchasing programs, um, you receive a financial bonus if you provide higher quality care or you receive a penalty if you provide low quality care. We also see something similar in MIPS for outpatient. Now CMS does have a national quality strategy. Uh, so they have eight priorities that they've established. They just redid their priorities in 2012. They're very similar to the priorities that they had previously, but um, they have added in a couple new ones as a result of the pandemic. So they're really looking at how they can embed quality into the care journey. So CMS has really put an increased emphasis on not just thinking of each individual section as its own healthcare entity, but thinking about how the patient is moving through those versus looking at each setting specifically, right? So really trying to think about that continuum of care. How is the patient progressing? How are they moving along? They added in this one uh, in 2022, advancing health equity, especially based on some of the inequities that the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted. We knew that those inequities were there, um, but CMS has put a much stronger focus into addressing them with some of the new items that they've added to the assessments, right, around literacy, transportation, race and ethnicity. That's all part of their national quality strategy of trying to improve equity because their opinion is if they can measure it, then they can change it. But if we don't have any data on it, it's hard to know where to apply the right intervention. They're also looking to promote safety and ideally achieve zero preventable harm. They wanna foster engagement to improve quality and build trust. So really trying to build that engagement between patients and caregivers. They wanna strengthen resiliency in the healthcare system. This is another new one that they added after the pandemic, obviously for um, because of some of the issues that we've had recently. So really trying to look at how can we improve our healthcare system, how it functions, how can we reduce burnout? So these are all things that CMS is actively looking into. Uh, they're really trying to embrace that digital age and improving those innovations and technology. So trying to move away from paper chart audits and claims and moving more into integration and advancement of technology through fire and interoperability, um, those sorts of things. So CMS is really trying to modernize uh, the care that they provide and how they assess quality. And then again, increasing quality measurement alignment to try and promote that coordination of care. So trying to, instead of having you know, measures for SNF and measures for home health and measures for the hospital. How can we kind of have one standardized list of quality measures that are measuring what we want them to um, without also providing overdue burden? So because it's difficult then to compare if every single setting has different quality measures, it's different than even to compare the settings. This is just a nice graphic of CMS's strategic pillars. They're very similar to the quality strategy, um, but just a kind of another visual representation of how they're thinking about quality. They also have what they've recently announced is the Universal Foundations. So this was actually just announced a few months ago. It's still very much in the early stages, uh, but they're looking to, at what quality measures they can utilize to follow a patient's lifespan. So all the way from pediatrics into adults. Uh, there are some key areas that they've identified, such as wellness, chronic conditions, behavioral health, care coordination. So basically that measure is readmissions, hospital readmissions. Um, the idea being, right, if you have high quality care coordination, then there shouldn't have to be a readmission. And then the person-centered care, which they're using CAPS currently, and then have health equity, which they're utilizing some of those new items on the uh, admission assessments for equity. So those are the key areas that they've identified. Again, this is not something that they're necessarily currently implementing. They're still requesting feedback. They're doing educational webinars about, but this is something that's coming down the line of those universal foundation, right? So along with aligning those quality measures. Um, they do have new, new health equity and social determinants of health that they're collecting. You've heard me reference a few times. So they have added these elements to um, the OASIS, and it's coming to the MDS in October. It's already in the IRFPI and L LCDS. Um, but these items are race, ethnicity, transportation, preferred language, the need for an interpreter, social isolation, and health literacy. So these are all questions that obviously falls very in line with what we assess as therapy practitioners, um, but by collecting this data, they're going to hopefully be able to provide some interventions to address those. 
Now on to the CMS Innovation Center, or also known as CMMI. Uh, so again, this was founded in 2012 as required as part of the Affordable Care Act, and their main job is to produce alternative payment models, or APMs. Uh, so they're really kind of an experimental area. Uh, so they can these can apply to a specific condition, to a care episode, or a population. Um, it really depends on what they're looking at, but some examples of alternative payment models that have become popular are accountable care organizations, that's a huge one, or ACOs, right, this idea of how can we have these groups and systems collaborate and be responsible for care? So they kind of provide capitated payments and it's where the primary care doctors work with the specialists and they take responsibility for that individual patient's care. Um, so those are very popular. We have the Comprehensive Joint Replacement Program, so or CJR. This is where, again, it's a bundled payment based on a patient's clinical condition for their care episode. So if they have a total joint replacement, CMS essentially says, okay, we'll give you, you know, let's say $30,000, and it's up to you how you spend that. So that's why we've seen a reduction a lot of times in therapy utilization, especially in like hip replacements, and really trying to look at what's absolutely necessary to provide because they're no longer, again, getting paid for every service that they provide. It's kind of that bundled payment. Hospital at home is another really popular one, especially during the pandemic and is continuing on. So this idea where you provide hospital level care in a patient's home started out as an experiment and has been growing. Uh, Value-based purchasing, again, also is something that was trialed by CMMI. So we'll talk about it for home health in a little bit. Uh, but they trialed it first in nine states, found that it was both cost-effective, it saved money, improved patient care, um, and so then they implemented it nationwide. So it's always interesting to look at CM, uh, the Innovation Center's website and see what kind of payment models they're testing out. A lot of them have to do with post-acute care and therapy. This is, again, another one of their graphics around their quality initiatives. So very, again, similar to what CMS has. Overall, they're looking at that health system to achieve equitable outcomes through quality, affordable, and person-centered care. They're then also looking at how they can drive accountable care. So they're really putting an emphasis on how can clinicians start taking responsibility for care instead of saying it's the patient's problem, how can they be held you know, responsible uh, for managing that patient's health. Looking at health equity, supporting innovation, affordability, and then partnering to achieve system transformation. So very similar to what CMS is focusing on, but with some small tweaks to fit the Innovation Center. Now here's some more details in the quality reporting program because we're gonna dive into some of the quality measures for post-acute care. So data is used to assure quality health care for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, these measures are developed again in collaboration with CMS and NQF and other organizations. So like I said, Battelle is stepping into that um, that contract, but NQF is primarily the one that you're still going to see is those NQF endorsed measures. Some of their initiatives are quality improvement, pay for reporting, public reporting, so right on care compare, and value-based purchasing program. The data for quality reporting program is primarily collected through claims, assessment instruments, chart abstractions, and registries. So this is also something that they're trying to standardize and move more into those electronic uh, quality measures where they're collecting the information instead of having you to submit a claim and then upload it to these dashboards that it would just be able to automatically pull them from the claims that are submitted um, through this fire language. So again, we're quite a few years away from that actually occurring, but that's something that they're trying to work towards. Uh, and these quality measures are often publicly reported through Care Compare. All right, any questions before we could dive into post-acute care? Okay. So post-acute care, um, it is a designated section of care facilities under CMS. Uh, they consider post-acute care to be consistent of the long-term care hospitals or LTACs, inpatient rehab facilities or ERFs, skilled nursing facilities or SNFs, and home health. So within these settings, we do have some standardized quality measurement, and one of the main ones is potentially avoidable events. Um, you may also hear these called potentially preventable events. The idea is that if we have high quality of care and better access to care, that these expensive healthcare events could be prevented. So they are utilized in all post-acute care settings as required by the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act, or IMPACT Act of 2014, um, the IMPACT Act is responsible for a significant amount of change in reimbursement. PDPM is from the IMPACT Act. PDGM is from the IMPACT Act, um, as well as the Unified Post-Acute Care Payment Model, which we'll talk about at the end, again, stemming from requirements of the IMPACT Act. 
So what are these potentially avoidable events? Um, so these are quality measures that they look at the all condition risk adjusted, potentially preventable hospital readmissions, so your readmission rates. Then they have a second one based on 30 day post-discharge readmission measures. So they have two readmission measures that they check in all post-acute care settings. We then have skin integrity or changes to skin integrity. So basically your skin breakdown, um, whether or not someone has new pressure sores um, or skin issues from when they were admitted to when they discharged, uh, the incidence of major fall, and then also healthcare-associated infections. And you'll hear these often called hospital-acquired infections in the hospital. Um, so they have very similar measures around many of these items, but after the hospital, they're called healthcare-associated infections. So we have CAUTI, which is the catheter-associated UTI, C. diff, MRSA, surgical site infections, and then central line associated bloodstream infection. So if you've ever wondered why facilities are so eager to remove indwelling catheters, um, one, they're associated with higher risk of UTI, but also because they are um, scored on the number of catheter associated UTIs that they have um, in their patient population. So if you don't have an indwelling catheter, it's hard to get a CAUTI. So we do have some standardization, right? Under the IMPACT Act, they are requiring to improve standardization of care. And we do have some standardization between LTAC, ERF, and SNF. So LTAC, ERF, and SNF have the exact same quality measures across the board, and it's actually a fairly decent short list. So we have individual with a care plan addressing function. This is basically whether or not Section GG was completed and scored. Um, I do believe that this is a quality measurement measure that is eventually being phased out as it's capped out, but it's currently still in effect. A percent of residents with one or more major falls or major injury, right? We're going back to those hospital or those healthcare associated um, issues, uh, drug or potentially preventable issues. There we go. Uh, the drug regimen review and follow up. So medication management, changes to skin integrity. Um, the main ones that impact therapy are these change in self-care, change in mobility, discharge self-care and discharge mobility score. These are based on 10 section GG items. So section GG, right, being our standardized assessment in CMS documents um, that score both self-care and mobility. We also have transfer of health information to patient and provider. So actually trying to track how information is being communicated. So is it being sent through fax? Was it handed to the patient? You know, via did they print it out? Was it sent through an EMR? And actually tracking whether or not that information is being handed off. So when the patient discharges from a SNF, are they being given a copy of their medication list? And is that copy of their medications also being sent to the home health agency that's taking over their care? Um, this will be implemented as of October 1st of 23 in skilled nursing facilities. So this year. We also have discharge to community. So really trying to incentivize them to go home. So this is often why inpatient rehab facilities do not want patients to discharge to SNF because uh, it would go against this quality measure. Uh, they are really trying to get them into home. So that could be assisted living. It could be independent living. It could be into their ind independent home. Um, it just means not discharging into an institution like SNF or the hospital. And then again, looking at those hospital associ healthcare associated infections. These are the 10 Section GG items that are utilized in the self-care and mobility score. Now, if you're wondering why the self-care items are so short, because it's only three, right? Eating, oral hygiene, and toileting hygiene. It's because LTAC has a shorter version of Section GG. So these are the items that overlap. AOTA and occupational therapy practitioners have been advocating to CMS to increase the number of items in the self-care uh, quality measure because can we really say someone's function has improved and we're only looking at eating, oral hygiene, and toileting? It's not even looking at dressing or bathing. Um, but because of that lack of overlap in LTAC, it makes it difficult to have standardized quality measures. And then in mobility, we have seven items. Your sit to lying, lying to sitting on side of bed, sit to stand, chair to bed transfers, toilet transfers. And these are walk or wheel 50 feet with two turns or walk or wheel 150 feet. So if someone's normally a wheelchair user, these would be assessed with wheelchairs. Now in home health, they, for whatever reason, still have their own quality measures. Um, I did recently ask someone who works with CMS why home health has their own quality measures, and they said they weren't sure, um, and asked if they had any plans to transition them, and they said they also were not sure. So we'll see. Uh, they have, but these again are very similar where they're really heavily focused on again, function. So improvement in bathing, ability to get in and out of bed, to ambulate, take medications correctly, right? There are a lot of these that therapy, especially occupational therapy can have a really positive impact on. And so these are really great opportunities to advocate for our care. 
Uh, we have timely initiation of care, and this is focused on making sure that you get out within the first 48 hours, which is something unique to home health. Again, we see that transfer of health information. So we do have some standardization, discharge to community, um, right, with an admission and discharge functional assessment, drug regimen review, those total normalized composite changes. So there are some standardization, uh, but not full standardization. And these items, these total normalized composite change in mobility and self-care, these are for value-based purchasing, which I do have that list later on. So how does value-based care impact us as rehab professionals? So payments are focused more on patient factors versus service provision. So we saw the elimination of rug levels in 2019, the elimination of therapy thresholds in home health, uh, right? Because there's a lot of concern over how those are really based on volume. So the more therapy that was provided, the more money that they would make. Um, so we saw those fully eliminated in the last couple of years. Uh, we also had change in expectations from payers and employers, right? How we are paid for our services influences the type of services that we are supposed to be providing. So if they are reimbursed based on value, then your employer is going to want you to produce a value of care versus if we're reimbursed based on volume, they're going to want volume. So it really changed how they view therapy. So an increased emphasis on function and mobility. So we had self-care and mobility quality measures implemented. Section GG was fully implemented. And then we do have functional level payment factors in ERF, SNF, and home health. There's also opportunities for therapy to support the care team through accurate scoring on admission and discharge assessments. Because of these new, especially the functional level payment factors, therapy can have a big impact on accurate scoring, which can lead to better and more accurate reimbursement. Because if a patient is being scored routinely as too functional, then the facility is not going to receive accurate reimbursement to cover the services that the patient needs. CMS does reimburse more for patients with a higher functional impairment because patients who are not moving around as well generally need more services, right? Um, just like patients with more comorbidities also generally need more services. So the reimbursement is adjusted in order to try and accommodate that. But if the data isn't accurate, if the scoring is not accurate, the reimbursement rates aren't going to be accurate. Uh, most likely, you're probably participating in some sort of alternative payment model, even if you don't know it. Uh, they are so prevalent uh, and across the board, like even in home health, right? The value-based purchasing is part of some of those APMs. And then also we can really make sure that we're engaging and providing innovative services. So there is some freedom in these value-based purchasing models that opens us up to being able to be a little more innovative with our care. So therapy reimbursement, we are predominantly now in value-based care models. So in acute care uh, inpatient and long-term care hospitals, we have diagnostic related groups or DRGs. So this is under Medicare Part A. We have inpatient rehab facilities, SNF under PDPM and home health under PDGM are all considered value-based care. Volume-based care models are pretty much anywhere that's still billing Medicare Part B because it is still very fee-for-service. The more minutes of therapy provided, the more money you make. So your home mods, outpatient, long-term care, et cetera, all Medicare Part B, still pretty much fee-for-service, unless you're part of those alternative payment models. So for long-term care hospitals, uh, we have Medicare Part A, so it covers long-term care. And it's reimbursed under the LTAC PPS or the LTAC Prospective Payment System. Uh, it has for its mission assessment, it has the Long-Term Care Hospital Continuity Assessment Record and Evaluation or CARE data set or LCDS. We have the Medicare Severity Long-Term Care Diagnosis Related Group. So again, very similar to acute care, it's still reimbursed under a DRG. There are a couple different separate calculations that make them a little bit different, but generally very similar to acute care. And LTAC, uh, the Medicare requires that the hospital has an average length of stay greater than 25 days. So these are going to be your patients who are pretty seriously ill. Um, so they're going to generally have multiple comorbidities. Um, often they're going to be on ventilators. They're really not mobilizing well, which is why they have that decreased section GG form, um, because they're generally just not able to complete many of the things that are on there. Uh, so Medicare does actually require that pretty extended length of stay. So they have to be there on average 25 days. Now, there are payment adjustments, just like in all the settings, based on location, area wages, and patient characteristics. They also have short-stay outliers, as well as high-cost outliers. For inpatient rehab, it's also reimbursed under Medicare Part A, and the Inpatient Rehab Prospective Payment System, or ERF PPS. The admission assessment, or the standardized assessment required by CMS, is the Inpatient Rehab Facility Patient Assessment Instrument, or the ERF PI. 
Um, so this data collected helps classify these patients into groups based on their clinical characteristics and anticipated needs. So it's prospective payment because you're getting that payment in anticipation of what the patient is going to require. So Medicare does require for as part of their reimbursement model for ERFs that it has three hours, of, the patient receives three hours of therapy at least five days a week. So ERF is where it's kind of interesting, where it is still considered a value-based care model, but it does still have that fee-for-service element because it is requiring a minimum of three hours of therapy. So that still has some of that volume involved. There also must be at least two therapy disciplines. So you can't just have OT or PT or speech. You have to have some combination of the three therapies or all three. If you only need OT or you only need PT, or you can only tolerate an hour of therapy a day, you are not eligible to have coverage for inpatient rehab under Medicare Part A. Patients do have a deductible and coinsurance for the benefit period for inpatient rehab, but it's lumped in with their acute care, so their hospital um, deductible. And then they also have a 60% rule. So this is another thing where if you've ever had a patient, you're trying to get them to ERF, and they were told they don't have a qualifying diagnosis, this is often what they're referring to. Generally, it's the diagnoses that you would expect, right, that need a lot of therapy. So your stroke, your spinal cord injury, multi-traumas, um, femur fractures, brain injuries, right? So things that you would kind of anticipate, diagnoses you anticipate need those three hours of therapy a day. So 60% of patients admitted to the ERF must meet these, one of these 13 diagnoses. Now, in skilled nursing facilities, there is a lot of concern over fraud and abuse. All you have to do is peruse the Office of Inspector General's website to see a lot of lawsuits with skilled nursing facilities, especially under the rug system. So they had something that was called hugging the rug, right? So we had these minute thresholds. And based on where the thresholds were, you would see that there would be a lot of patients right at that threshold, and then it would drop off, and a lot more patients at the next threshold, and then it would drop off. So there really wasn't any patients receiving the amount of therapy in between because there was an incentive. So that's why they called it hugging the rug. Um, under the skilled nursing facility uh, PPS, so the prospective payment system again, right? we now have what is more commonly called the patient-driven payment model. So the SNF PPS and PDPM are basically one and the same, but they're more commonly called the patient-driven payment model now. Uh, this was implemented October 1st of 2019, so we had a little bit of time before the pandemic started. Uh, how payment is now calculated, so there used to be only a few different categories, um, but now there's, I believe, over a thousand different combinations. So you have patient characteristics that are identified on the minimum data set, or MDS at admission, so the same thing as like the ERF pie, we have the MDS and SNF. There is an OT payment com component, which we'll get into. It's based on their clinical category and their functional score. So those same 10 section GG items. And they must receive either daily skilled nursing or five days a week of skilled therapy. They must also have an inpatient hospital stay prior to being admitted to the SNF. So that's that three midnight rule. Now we did see a waiver for that under the public health emergency. That waiver has since expired. So it is now a requirement again that you have a three midnight stay. However, there are some ACOs that do have waivers for that. So if you work for one of those ACOs, your patients can still go to SNF without an inpatient hospital stay. So unfortunately, though, for most patients, if they are on observation in the hospital, they are not able to go to SNF. SNF does have a value-based purchasing program. Um, so the law has authorized CMS to expand quality measures under value-based purchasing. Um, and they've also have technical expert panels that discuss how to evaluate volume or value-based purchasing. Um, the program has changed a lot. I'll admit that it's not one of my strong suits of knowing much about the SNF uh, value-based purchasing, but it's something to know that is there, right? So that, again, that incentive system of the higher quality care they provide, theoretically, they can receive then a payment bonus versus they're providing really low quality care, they can receive a payment penalty. So here's more details on how therapy is paid for in skilled nursing facilities. So even though PDPM kind of functions similarly to this idea of a bundled payment model, it's technically a variable per diem payment system. And what this means is that a skilled nursing facility receives a payment for each day that the patient is in that facility. So it's not just kind of a lump sum for the care. They, depending on how long their stay is, depends how much money they receive. So, and it varies from day to day. So for therapy and nursing, the facility receives the same payment for the first 20 days, and then the payment decreases every seven days after that. So let's say for the first 20 days, the patient receives or the SNF receives, you know, $10 a day. Obviously, it's more than that. Uh, but then starting after that, it goes down to eight, goes down to six. 
So every seven days after that, the reimbursement goes down. Obviously, this aligns then too with how Medicare Part A covers 100% of the first 20 days and then 80% of the last 80. Um, but this is also why skilled nursing facilities try and get patients moving out and why then therapists also feel pressure to decrease the amount of time they spend with patients as they surpass those 20 days because the reimbursement is going down. The reason reimbursement goes down, so at least as far as CMS has justified it, is that a patient should be making improvement, right? So they shouldn't receive, shouldn't need the same level of care that they received at admission at discharge, theoretically, assuming that value-based care is being provided. So reimbursement then goes down with that. Non-therapy ancillary is another component of the PDPM payment, and this is reimbursed more upfront because this is prescription drugs. So the reason this is paid upfront is because, right, when you go to the pharmacy, you normally collect, you know, 60 days of pills or 30 days of pills. You wouldn't pay per pill per day. So this is to make sure that skilled nursing facilities are still incentivized to take patients with prescription drugs um, and make sure that they're still fully reimbursed for those prescriptions. So if the patient discharges and they leave with 10 pills, the SNF has already still gotten paid for that prescription. So OT and PT, they have their own case mix. Um, they're the same, calculated the same. AOTA did advocate for OTs to be separate from PTs, but unfortunately the claims data that just wasn't there to support um, them being different. So the case mix index for OT and PT is based on the primary reason for therapy. So that therapy diagnosis and also the GG items, which I've had them coming up again, but it's those same 10. The speech therapy case mix index is based on the primary reason for speech. So it's a little more complicated to calculate. Uh, it's based on the patient's cognitive status, whether or not they have a swallowing disorder, or man mechanically altered diet, and other related speech comorbidities. So the way that CMS kind of visualizes it is they have like little dots that kind of grow and shrink. So if the OT and PT, you know, for one patient, their case mix index might show that they need more therapy um, versus speech or like the nursing might be bigger on another. So it's really supposed to kind of adjust based on those patient needs. So again, this is just a reminder that these are the section GG items that are utilized for that case mix index, those three eating items and those seven um, mobility items. So the same as the quality measures. Again, another element in PDPM, which I think PDPM is one of the more complicated payment models because it has so many different elements. Um, there is a 25% limit on concurrent and group therapy per discipline. Now, technically there is not a formalized um, penalty in place for violating it, but CMS is keeping track of facilities that do violate the group and concurrent therapy requirement, especially routinely. So even though there's not currently a penalty, it doesn't mean there won't be one in the future. So there's a 20%, 25% limit, and this is per discipline. So you can't have 30% be group and concurrent for PT and have it balance out with only 20% for OT. It's per discipline. CMS defines a group as two to six patients doing the same or similar activities, concurrent being as two patients doing different activities. And it's always important to remember that it is not required under PDPM. There is nothing in the regulation that says that all patients must receive group and concurrent ther therapy. In fact, it is the opposite. CMS still indicates that individual therapy should be the primary mode of therapy and that it is up to the therapist's discretion to determine when and if group and concurrent interventions are appropriate. So the big question, how has PDPM impacted therapy and outcomes? Well, there was a study that was completed after the implementation of PDPM, and this is the association between patient-driven payment model and therapy utilization and outcomes in U.S. skilled nursing facilities. This actually mirrors a very similar um, study that was done before PDPM that looked at Medicare and Medicare Advantage patients, and they found very similar outcomes. So this is a cross-sectional study that looked at over 200,000 patients that had a hip fracture. So it's important to kind of note with this study that it is a patient, you know, the hip fracture population is generally going to be a population that needs less therapy than someone who's had a stroke or other more complex conditions. Um, but what they found is that patients that were admitted post PDPM received about 13% fewer therapy minutes on average than those before PDPM. So it did show a behavior change as a result of reimbursement in terms of decreased therapy, which I think if you talk to any therapist that's been working in a SNF, anecdotally, they would tell you that this is accurate, that there's definitely been a decline in therapy use. However, with that decline in therapy utilization, the likelihood of rehospitalization and functional scores did not change. So basically what this is saying is that even though therapy went down, the quality of care did not decrease. The outcomes of care did not decrease. So 
this is what, what is indicating through this research is that there was an overabundance or overprovision of therapy that did not also then increase the quality of care. Now, obviously this information is only as accurate as the data that is submitted. So if people are not scoring those functional scores correctly, um, that can definitely influence the study. But overall, it confirmed what we already knew is that there was an overprovision of care um, pre-PDPM. Now in home health, we have another fun complex payment model. We have the home health prospective payment system, which is again, more commonly called the patient-driven groupings model, PDGM versus PDPM. So PDGM was implemented January 1st of 2020. So just before um, everything shut down. So made it a really difficult time for home health agencies. Under home health, we have the outcomes and assessment information set for the OASIS, which is similar, right? to the MDS and the IRFPI. Um, the PDGM did eliminate therapy thresholds. So kind of like the rugs, there was therapy thresholds where if you provided up to six visits, you made a certain amount. If you provided like, I want to say it was like six and 14, you got X amount of dollars and then six to, or 14 to 20, you got that much, but then Medicare didn't pay for anything over 20 visits in an episode. So they eliminated therapy thresholds because they felt that that was too volume based. And they implemented what they call home health resource groups or HERGs. And there are over 400 options, so 400 combinations of reimbursement. Um, I believe the exact number is like 432. But there are four main uh, categories that go into considering the HERG, uh, which is the admission source and mission timing. So they look at community versus institution and early versus late. The clinical category, so their primary diagnosis, why are they receiving home health services? The functional level, something that therapy can heavily influence, right, in terms of accurate scoring, and comorbidities. Now the functional level is different from other settings where in LTAT or in IRFPI and SNF, right? It's based on section GG. In home health, it's based off of the M1800 numbers. And same thing for their quality measures. In LTAC, IRF and SNF, their quality measures are based on section GG. In home health, they're based on the M1800 numbers or some of the OASIS items. And they do not utilize section GG for payment or quality in home health. Uh, so the functional level is determined by the M1800 items, which if you're not familiar with the OASIS, those are the ADL items, um, as well as the hospital readmission risk. And so there are three categories. There's low, medium, and high, and patients with a low functional impairment receive less funding, funding versus if they have a high functional impairment, you get more funding to accommodate needing more care. So that's why accurate scoring, especially on admission, is absolutely critical. Now, some updates to home health is that OT continues to not be a qualifying discipline for the initial order, but we are a qualifying discipline for recertification. What this means is that if a patient wants home health services under Part A, they do have to have another discipline on there. So either PT, speech, or nursing. Um, but AOTA is just about to introduce new legislation called the Home Health Accessibility Act. Uh, we already have sponsors lined up, and so we're just waiting for it to be introduced. And that legislation would add occupational therapy as a qualifying discipline. So make sure to contact your legislators and ask them to pass that bill. Um, we do now have the ability to complete the start of care oasis in therapy only cases. This is permanent. So under the public health emergency, we were able to initiate the start of care in any case, even when nursing was available. Um, but that has expired again when the public health emergency expired on May 11th, but it is permanently into the regulation that we are able to do it in therapy only cases, making us equal with PT and speech therapy. So we had to get that step done first before we could ask for the qualifying discipline. Um, so it's exciting now to see that advocacy ongoing. So how does PDPM implement or impacted therapy or PDGM? So there has been a decline in therapy visits that started in calendar year 2019 when therapy threshold removal was finalized. So in 2019, CMS announced that they would be moving to PDGM. And so then home health agencies were starting to prepare for PDGM to be fully implemented in 2020. So what this table is, it is actually from the home health proposed rule of 2023. So they actually went through the data and they looked at, they did a look back of how many visits on average patients are receiving. Now, remember what I said is that previously, if you looked back, right, they were receiving an average of like 73 visits over the full episode. If you look here, they're obviously receiving significantly less. Now these are 30 days. So, right, because under PDGM, it switched to a 30 day payment instead of 60, which is why these are simulated. They probably just took like how many they received in 60 days and approximately divided them in half. But if you look at therapy, definitely decreased. So OT went from on average 1.2 visits, uh, 1.02 visits in 2018 
down to 0.77 visits in 2021. Um, now, again, there's lots of patients that don't receive therapy. So on average, patients do receive more than just one visit of OT, um, but this is kind of out of all the cases. But you can see overall that the number of visits also declined from 9.86 to 8.22. And the reason CMS pulled out this table was to show that not only did um, they were trying to show that the reduce reduction in therapy visits and the reduction in services was not a result only of the pandemic. So because we start to see this behavior change in 2019, that it's showing that home health agencies were starting to prepare for the implementation of PDGM and started reducing care already. So this was so CMS felt comfortable concluding that the behavior change in CMS or in home health was as a result of PDGM and not necessarily a result of pandemic. Obviously, it had an impact. Um, but they felt that it was pretty clear, the correlation. So some food for thought, right? How does What does this mean for therapy? Well, we used to be a revenue producer. Now we are considered a direct cost. So we used to be firmly in the green, right? Especially under rug levels, under fee for service, with therapy thresholds, more therapy meant more money. So they wanted more therapists to be there. Now we are seeing a direct cost. So instead of seeing adding to income, we're seen as being taking away as a line item. So facilities are really questioning, why should they pay an OT or PT to do something that they think an aide can do or an activity director could do, right? Uh, why should I pay an occupational therapist 50, 40, $50 an hour when I can pay a tech $15 an hour? If the patient is going to get showered either way, what is it that OT is doing that makes them two, three, four times as expensive as an aide when at the end of the day, the patient still receives a shower, the patient still gets dressed, the patient's happy. Are they the same quality? We know they're different, but how do we explain that to someone else? So really making sure and questioning ourselves, you know, is what I'm doing high value? Is it worth what I'm getting paid? Um, and also really questioning and thinking about, were we truly providing value-based care before payment changed? The data would say no, right? If we look at some of, PD, some of that change with PDPM and showing that even though there's a 13% decrease in therapy, we still didn't see a change in functional outcomes. And that has been seen in other alternative payment models that they've been looking at, that there has been a decrease in post-acute care utilization, but we're not seeing changes in mortality. We're not seeing changes in patient satisfaction. So what does that mean for therapy? Are we actually providing value? And what can we do to make sure that we are providing value? And again, kind of thinking about, you know, what role did we play in driving up care costs? Um, and so we have to take some of that historical responsibility as well in if we weren't making sure that we were providing high value care and we were just providing more and more therapy, what role did we play in kind of putting in our own um, our own parameters? Because obviously they felt that spending was out of control and felt the need to put in those caps. So on that note, what is the future of value-based care? What's coming up? So for the future of value-based care, um, we're going to see the continued expansion of value-based care models, right? Value-based care is not going away. It is only going to continue to grow. Personally, I think this is a great opportunity for occupational therapy, especially because we're so focused on value, on function, on mobility, and really improving their overall health that I think value-based care overall can be really positive for us, especially because of our scope of practice is so broad that we can be really flexible and innovative as these payment models continue to get broader, which allows for more innovation. We're also going to see the development of a unified post-acute care payment system, and I have some more slides on that. It's a really interesting, the way that they're thinking about the unified PAC payment that's part of the IMPACT Act that's requiring unified post-acute care. We're going to, again, continue to see reduction in fee-for-service. So this is time to start thinking about what will this look like for Medicare Part B, right? What would it look like for outpatient? Would it be bundled payments based on the evaluation code that we pick? You know, what exactly would CMS try to consider when looking at a bundled payment for Part B? Or is it going to be more episodic, like we see with the Comprehensive Joint Replacement Program? So things to kind of think about and prepare for, especially as we're running businesses. Um, we're going to, again, continue to see the increased presence of bundled payments similar to that Comprehensive Joint Replacement Program, or CJR. Quality measures continue to be reevaluated and changed, especially we're going to see that with Battelle taking over. Um, so be prepared for those changes. In the SNF proposed rule, there was changes proposed to the quality measures. Generally, we have two to three years of heads up, but something to be paid attention to. We are seeing the expansion of CMS assessments. So currently, it is only in skilled nursing facilities where you're required to complete the MDS on all patients, regardless of payer. That is being expanded in 2025 to ERF 
to inpatient rehab and home health. So the IRF pie will be required on all patients, regardless of payer status, and the OASIS will be required on all patients, again, regardless of payer status. Um, so that'll be your Medicare Advantage, your private practice, your cash pay, potentially, right? Um, that you will have to complete that OASIS. So that way they can start kind of comparing when you have standardized assessments, how care is being provided through payers. And also they're still continuing to expand the health equity data collection on CMS assessments. So with PAC standardization, so this started with Impact Act of 2014, led again to the eventual development of Section GG. So before they had like the FIM and inpatient rehab, we had Section G in the MDS, and then we had the M1800 items in the OASIS. And so you were comparing apples to oranges to bananas. So even though they were all asking about upper body dressing, you couldn't compare them. You couldn't look at how a patient was progressing. But now that we have Section GG, you can look at and say, okay, a patient was a three in inpatient rehab and then a four in a sniff, but a two in home health, what happened there, right? So they can actually compare how a patient is progressing through that continuum of care. They've continued to standardize quality measures in LTAC, ERF, SNF, and home health. They've obviously been more successful at standardizing the first three than home health, but home health does still have some overlap. And we're eventually moving towards that unified PAC system. So there is some congressional advocacy. Uh, this is an old home health or an old um, number for this act. It was introduced in the 117th Congress, and we haven't seen it reintroduced yet. But it was the in Resetting the Impact Act, or TRIA. Um, basically, CMS is asking Congress to pass legislation to allow them to update the information, the data that they're collecting. They did not expect that the unified PAC system would take so long to develop, but it's proven to be incredibly difficult. Um, oh, and then I got ahead of myself, but yes, requiring the assessments for all payers as of 2025. So what does a unified post-acute care payable model look like? Well, in 2019, there was over $57 billion spent on post-acute care alone. So they're really trying to think about how they can try and reduce some of that spending. Currently, each post-acute care setting has its own payment system. So it is calculated differently in every single pack. There's inconsistent distribution of settings, uh, which can lead to patients with similar characteristics being treated in different settings with different payments and costs. So they've really kind of looked like, especially if you look at ERF and SNF, right? Sometimes the reason that someone goes to inpatient rehab isn't because of their clinical condition, but because of the three midnight rule. We can't get them into a SNF, so they go to inpatient rehab. Or sometimes you have a patient who maybe could have used inpatient rehab, but we're sending them to SNF because the inpatient rehab denied them because of the diagnosis, right? So, but the cost difference between inpatient rehab and SNF is very different. Inpatient rehab is a lot more. So they've kind of looked at that where, you know, why is one patient going to one setting over the other? So there is a prototype that's been proposed by MedPAC, which is the advisory board Congress. Um, so they have three categories. So you kind of sound similar. It's kind of almost a hybrid of PDPM and PDGM. So they have three categories. First consider there's medical and diagnosis focused. Um, so medical, they have re rehabilitation and therapy focused or rehab and medical management, teaching and assessment or MMTA. So that's kind of their primary clinical reason. So what is the main reason for care? Is it medical? Is it rehab? Or is it the MMTA category? Then they are proposing they be assigned to a post-acute care case mix group is what they're calling it. So kind of think of that almost like the HERG or something like that. Um, so re rehab is differentiated based on the beneficiary's motor function score. So, right, that self-care and mobility. MMTA will have two motor function-based uh, case mix groups. And I have an image that helps clarify this a little bit. And then the medical group is based a lot more on primary diagnosis. And then the motor function score currently is set up to still be those same 10 section GG items using LTAC, ERF, and SNF. Now, there has also been conversation around removing functional scores as part of a payment element because of how it can be gamified, right? It's a lot harder to gamify someone's diagnosis or comorbidities, um, but it's a lot easier to tell your staff to score a patient really low on admission and really high on discharge, right? So where we see the most fraud is with adjustments of Section GG scores. Um, so there has been discussion around removing that as a payment component, but then that's obviously concerning for therapy because then what's there to ensure that patients are getting paid or that facilities are incentivized to provide therapy if that's not part of the payment category. So we'll see how that pans out. But this is the image. Um, again, this is included in the handout, which let me see, I've got the link. 
here. Yep. So this is the link if in case anyone doesn't have it, I put it in the chat. Um, but this is the handout for our, the image from MedPack. So you, as you can kind of see, um, it shows kind of what diagnoses might fall under that unified pack group or the up G up CG, um, you know, kind of things that you would think, right. For rehab, it's lower extremity fracture, joint replacement, orthopedic surgery, trauma, limb loss, orthopedic stroke, spinal dysfunction, TBI, Versus your medical and diagnosis, behavioral health, comatose, um, ventilator, cancer, skin issues, kidney issues. Because think about right how complicated it is to create a payment model that not only accounts for the complexity of a LTAC patient, but also for the lower level of acuity of a home health patient. How do you create a payment model that can span the level of care that's that broad? I think if it was just inpatient to home health, it would be much easier to create that payment model than someone who is potentially comatose on a ventilator versus someone who's able to be home and walking around, you know, standby assist, right? And then they've got these other items where they're kind of showing the case mix groups and how they relate. And then some certain adjustments based on the provider adjustments, pack setting adjustments, comorbidities, and then the final payment weight. MedPack has a really long discussion of it if you're interested in it. Um, it could be a, a fun Sunday read, um, but really kind of interesting how they're thinking about these issues. And what does that mean for therapy? You know, could we potentially see um, a merging of inpatient rehab and SNF facilities into one? Would it just be a post-acute care center? Or will we still have ERF and SNF? But if we do, what makes them different if they're all paid the same? So just kind of things to think about. I think whenever this, if it ever comes to fruition, would probably be a significant overhaul of how we practice therapy in the U.S., now we still are having an expansion of value-based purchasing. So this again, links the reimbursement with quality of care provided. It also has incentive payments and penalties. Um, so we do have it both in home health and in SNF. So we saw the expansion of value-based purchasing nationwide in 2023. And then we have the incentive payment for SNFs under Medicare PPS. And this has been in place for a while um, versus value-based purchasing is still relatively new to home health. Now, if we're continuing to look at the future of value-based care, these are some, this is a look into some of what the Innovation Center was looking at. So they did a synthesis of evaluation results across 21 Medicare models. So these were ones that they were testing between 2012 and 2020. 14 of them demonstrated gross savings to Medicare, which is one of the goals, right, to improve quality of care as well as reduce costs. 10 of them led to a reduction in inpatient admissions, a good goal, right, because admissions are expensive. 14 led to a reduction in post-acute care. But here's where things are a little bit interesting, right? These models targeted at reducing acute or specialty care were more likely to show savings and generally had a more positive impact on utilization versus those focused on primary care or population management. So those looking really kind of where therapy is involved, right? We're not as involved in primary care and population management currently. In healthier populations, that's a lot harder to show you know, quality improvement versus these are the big spenders, acute and specialty care. Eight of the nine models addressed changes in healthcare delivery for acute and specialty care, targeted populations, and they showed a significant reduction in PAC utilization and spending. So this is a kind of assessment where you can see, right, they have any post-acute care institutional PAC, um, which I believe is your healthcare, your LTAC, um, SNF, ERF, ERF, and home health. Um, and if you look, I again have a link to this in the handout, so it goes through this chart much better than I can right now. Um, but they show that, you know, the B BPCIs are bundled payments for care improvement. These are very popular. There's a bunch of them. Um, but overall is showing as a positive a decrease in post-acute care utilization and sometimes a pretty significant. So if you look at this one, Model 2, they had a 32% reduction in inpatient rehab use. Um, the CJR led to an increase, a decrease in inpatient rehab, an increase in home health, right? That's not to be surprising. Um, so we saw an overall uh, decrease, a 28% decrease in utilization of inpatient rehab as a result of the CJR and a 20% increase in home health. So that for them was a success uh, because it meant that patients were not being given care in a more expensive setting. But as we know, under CGR, we've still seen improved outcomes. So obviously that inpatient rehab, that expense was not necessary. And then under home health value-based purchasing, we saw again, that's where these two blue arrows are, a 6% decrease in SNF and no change in home health utilization, which is pretty much to be expected. So quality outcomes, what does this mean, right? We would like to think as therapists, if patients are receiving significantly less post-acute care, that this would mean they're having worse outcomes, right? Because they're receiving less therapy. 
Unfortunately, that's not what it showed. Um, there was no significant change in patient reported experience for seven of those models, including comprehensive joint replacement and home health value based purchasing. So overall, patients were still satisfied with their care. Now, some um, BPCI models did have fewer respondents with the highest level of satisfaction. So like they maybe went, they were maybe slightly less satisfied, but they considered them generally small in magnitude. So they, but they did not have worse functional scores. So maybe they were a little more upset with their outcome. They weren't overall like displeased with the care, but most importantly, they didn't have a functional status change. So or worse functional status change. So even though we had that significant reduction in therapy, the patient outcomes are still the same. Um, and three out of eight had significant reductions in mortality, including home health value-based purchasing versus comprehensive joint replacement did not have a significant change. So again, if we are seeing a reduction in therapy use through post-acute care, but we're not seeing changes in mortality and we're not seeing a decrease in functional outcomes, what does that mean for therapy? What does that mean that we're doing? Um, other interesting ones that they're testing out, right? So they had home health value-based purchasing, and they also have prior authorization for repetitive scheduled non-emergent ambulance transport. Um, and these are both certified for national expansion. So important data elements that they were looking at through all of those payment models was beneficiary satisfaction. So were patients still satisfied with their care? Cost was a big one, looking at readmissions, infections, and service utilization, mortality, and functional outcomes. So at least CMS is recognizing that function is important. It is critical. But again, if we are not able to tie therapy to functional improvement and functional outcomes, that's going to be a very difficult road for us going down. So we have to be thinking about, are we really living up to the value of care? Or have we been living in a volume-based system for so long that we don't know how to provide high value care? So it leads to this question, are we providing high value services? What does that look like? What does that mean? You know, really sitting back and taking that skeptic's perspective of, are we really living up to the hype of what therapy is? I think that majority of therapy is high quality. It is high value. It's evidence-based, but are there opportunities for improvement? And how do we do that? So how do we demonstrate our value? One of the ways we can do that is operating at the top of our license. So thinking about what are services that only we can provide? So that kind of skilled service, right? Performing activities that utilize the full extent of our education. So part of this can be helping by identify tasks that could be completed by a non-skilled individual. Now I put that in quotations because yes, admin staff, techs are definitely skilled in their job, but they're not considered a skilled service under Medicare. So these tasks could look like scheduling, clerical work, retrieving equipment, ordering supplies, right? Things that oftentimes therapists find themselves doing, but don't require our level of education. So are there ways to better show our value um, by you know, focusing on the things that only we can provide? And are there opportunities to then improve systems to where we have someone who is less expensive being able to do some of this work? making sure that we're actually demonstrating our value and documenting it. So staying current with payment and policy changes, it's pretty hard to make sure that we're re remaining in compliance if we don't even know the regulations that are governing our practice, which is why it's so important to understand how your services are being paid for in order to make sure that you're meeting those standards. Uh, you also want to identify quality measures that are directly impacted by therapy, so especially those functional outcomes. So you can actually look up your facility's scores. So go to Care Compare. Um, if you just look up Care Compare in Google, it'll come up um, and you can type in your facility name or even your zip code. And AOTA has fantastic quality checklists that you can use together with those um, and look at what are their quality scores? How are they performing? So let's say that your facility is underperforming in change in self-care. That's a pretty good indicator that maybe there's something going on with either the assessments aren't being scored accurately, which therapy can help with because we're experts in function and mobility, right? Or maybe the patient isn't receiving the appropriate interventions. And so we can help them show how patients can improve. So you can utilize those quality measures and payment to make an argument for why therapy is necessary. You can take training on CMS assessments. They're absolutely free through CMS and they're, they speak really slowly, but they're very high quality. So you can just speed them up, but taking those, um, that training to make sure that we are scoring the items accurately making sure we're remaining client-centered, client so focusing on what the patient wants versus just kind of doing the stuff that comes easy to us that we've been doing for years, utilizing evidence-based and high-value interventions and services, so staying current with what is evidence-based, um, always advocating for early involvement of therapy services. Oftentimes, those admission assessments have to be completed quickly. In home health, you have five days. In SNF, I believe you have three. 
So if you have a patient where OT isn't even getting out to the patient for two weeks, then your data can't even be utilized as part of the OASIS. But if we can get you out quickly, if we can get OT involved quickly, or even a SNF if they don't see an OT for four days, then our information can't be utilized. So if we can advocate for early therapy involvement, we can hopefully get better scoring, which can lead to better and more accurate reimbursement and quality outcomes. And then of course, make sure you're documenting your services and billing for them accurately. I cannot stress that enough that the information that you are writing down is going to insurance. They are reviewing it. They are looking at claims. The lack of documentation to support OT's role in cognition is part of why we don't have cognition included as our PDPM payment and why it is in SNF, um, which led to a lot of confusion when PDPM was rolled out. Uh, but there was just not sufficient claims data to support OT's role in cognition in skilled nursing facilities. So make sure to document what it is you're doing because your documentation does inform the payment models of the future. We already talked about this a little bit, but utilizing care compare, right? Seeing how your facilities score up against others, identifying opportunities for therapy, and utilizing that CMS data to identify the benefits of therapy services. So these are really great objective ways to say why therapy is important beyond kind of just reiterating our elevator pitch to them. And rethinking practice. I think there was a big shift, right? We have, how do we train clinicians to shift away from volume-based systems into a value-based? PDPM came in overnight. So on, you know, the last day of August, we were still expected to provide lots and lots of therapy minutes. And then the first day of October in 2019, all of a sudden, everything has changed. But was there training? Was there new education to try and help therapists think about how they provide services quickly? I still see so many therapists clinging to those exercise groups, you know, kind of trying to do some of the things they used to do under rugs, but now they're no longer really being incentivized to do that. And it's been a really hard mental shift. So how do we shift away from that volume-based mindset into value? How do we identify which interventions are high quality? This can be really challenging. You know, how do we know that what we're doing is useful? How do we know that it's having an impact? How do we know that it's appropriate for our patient? There's not necessarily an easy answer, um, but so thinking through those questions, though, because that's a, those are things that we're going to be asked. Um, how can plan of care be adapted to better fit patient needs and reflect the realities of reimbursement? We do have to acknowledge that in many instances, reimbursement is going down, right? Um, under the Medicare physician fee schedule, our reimbursement has gone down. Um, if you look at PDPM, the reimbursement decreases every seven days and home health, it decreases every 30 days. So we can't continue to expect facilities to want us to provide the same amount of therapy throughout the whole episode if the reimbursement is going down, right? That doesn't make fiscal sense. So how can we be more flexible in our plan of cares to both reflect what the patient needs and understand the realities of reimbursement? And how do we balance providing that value to both our patients and our employers, right? These are things that if you own a business, you have to think about as well as how do you remain afloat, right? If the business can't stay um, afloat, if they can't pay their employees, then no one's receiving care. So how do we try and balance those some, at times, conflicting priorities? And what are the ethical considerations we must address around adjusting care based on reimbursement, right? Because it's not always appropriate to do that. So are we providing less care? due to a lack of coverage? Uh, are we providing care in excess because it's paid for? I have definitely heard of clinicians both. I have heard clinicians say to me before that, you know, maybe the patient should be discharged, but their facility, you know, or but their insurance approved them to have 20 visits. So we're going to max out those 20 visits because if we don't, he won't get them. So let's go ahead and keep them on caseload, right? So Thinking about those things, I have seen both sides. And so making sure that we are really considering um, where our ethics are and legally also where we are in terms of making sure um, that we're providing appropriate care. Advocacy is always key, right? So making sure, again, that your documentation does influence payment models of the future. One of the only ways that CMS and other payers have to understand what it is that we do is through our documentation and through our claims. Um, another example of here in our state, we've been advocating with a private insurer around re-adding occupational therapy as a telehealth service. And they said one of the main ways they're going to do that is by performing an audit of occupational therapy documentation to see if we met the qualification. So we're basically hoping that OTs in our state did a good job of documenting the quality of care they were providing to try and justify why we should be added as telehealth providers. So that's where, again, when we're just kind of writing down our notes and submitting them for our claims, we don't always think about the future implications. 
Um, identifying objective ways to demonstrate our value. Section GG can be a good way to identify that in an objective measure. Plus it then also aligns with payment, with quality. So making sure that we're not just saying it's not fair or I know therapy is high quality. Do we have any objective information to back that up? You can participate in technical expert panels and other relevant coalitions. AOTA is always nominating folks to technical expert panels, but anyone is welcome to nominate themselves. Um, so participating in those groups can really be helpful. Providing comments during the rulemaking process. Um, I believe the SNF and inpatient rehab one recently closed, but the home health proposed rule should be coming out soon. And anyone can comment on those rules um, and, and submit your opinions. And making sure you're staying engaged and aware of policy changes before they've been implemented. So just by being here, right, you're showing that you're interested in it. You're showing that you're wanting to pay attention and know what's going on. But staying aware of what those policies happen before they happen um, is really important to making sure not only that we can identify misinformation, which is really rampant even to this day, um, but that we're also able to adjust our care accordingly. Um, professional associations at the national and state level can really help facilitate that involvement and that advocacy. So I encourage you to stay involved. So to sum things up, I wanted to kind of circle back to that how high do we jump? And this kind of goes back to when they were developing the guidelines for claims on outpatient services uh, for occupational therapy with CMS. And one of the things that they felt to highlight is that one important feature of this document isn't its definition for what is not occupational therapy. If it is not in the guidelines, it is not paid for. Becoming a standard used by, so this talking about this Medicare Part B document. So because this document is becoming a standard, standard used by most insurance companies, its significance in defining occupational therapy is substantial. Fortunately for the profession, occupational therapists assisted in its development at the government's request. So this is from, again, 1989. So this is when Medicare was developing the guidelines of what occupational therapy is and is not. So it's important, again, too, to think about when do we start conflating what is paid for versus what is in our scope of practice, what falls under our license. And this shows the importance of being involved, because if AOTA, if our other occupational therapy stakeholders were not involved in collaborating with CMS on the definition of what OT is, who would be defining us? Would it be a random government official? Would it be a physician? Would it be a PT, right? Who is it, whose role is it to define what occupational therapy is? So just kind of circling back again to the 1990s of scenes that we are still dealing with even today in modern care. So I find it reassuring to know that what we're dealing with is something that's been dealt with over time. You could see it, I guess, is pessimistic as well. Um, but it's helpful to know that these are struggles that we're always going to have. Payment is always going to be experienced. There is no perfect healthcare system. Um, it's all just part of the process. So that is it. I've got my contact information. I have references. Um, I will again plug the resource list in here. So I don't normally send out my slides. I just send out resource lists that have um, images and uh, links and all sorts of stuff there. So a handy list to keep around and also typed out some of the stuff that was on the slides. But that's it. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Um, I have a question, Clarice. Yeah. Thank you so, so much for all of this information. I feel like I just need to go like lay down and think about it for a couple of hours. <laughs> but I was wondering if you could speak to, I, I don't know all of the details about this, but as OTs are becoming more confident with private practice and becoming business owners. I have read some articles and just talked with different people about how this could be like how we'd be kind of missing out um, if we're not part of accountable care organizations in terms of value-based purchasing. And I know like then like MIPS might play into it too. Is there anything that you have to like share on that right now? I don't have anything that I can think of off the top of my head on that. I did. It's funny that you say that because I did actually, when I was a fieldwork student at AOTA, um, if you look up my maiden name, Clarice Miller in AJOT um, or accountable care organizations, I wrote a poli policy perspective article on the role of OT and ACOs. Um, but I think that is a really key area that we can be involved in. And ACOs get really kind of funky in how they work and where the money comes and goes. Cause there's also clinically integrated networks, which is like the private, the private pay side of ACO. So like Blue Cross Blue Shield might have a clinically integrated network, but I do think it's a really great opportunity for us to collaborate with 
like ACOs and show kind of how we can help prevent readmissions because the big things in ACOs is it's capitated payments. So right, like kind of like Planet Fitness, right, where you get a certain amount each month, regardless of whether or not the patient's using care. And if we can show how well we keep people out of the hospital through either home mods or just our regular OT interventions, I think that's a really good marketing point for ACOs. I know there's been OTs, um, like I met an OT who did her capstone once, like working high up in an ACO um, as a post-professional. So I know there's research on there out of there. I just can't think of it off the top of my head unless you want to look at my article from 2017 that might give some ideas, but ACOs are a really fascinating one. And I do think it's a really great opportunity. So if I come across anything, I'll, I'll make sure to, to send it your way. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? I know that's a lot of information as always. Thanks, Domina. And yes, there will be a recording. I probably, to be honest with you, it will not be sent out most likely until Monday. Um, so the recording will be available for seven days, but if you want to keep access to the recording, it'll be put into the Amplify OT membership and that'll also be where the CE quiz is. So if you want CE credit for attending or want access to the recording for longer, um, then it'll be in the Amplify OT membership platform along with all of my other courses. So it won't just be this course if you join, it's my Section GG webinar, my OASIS webinar, Mastering OT Policy and Medicare, Medicare updates. Um, so all sorts of all sorts of fun and good stuff to overwhelm your brain with in there. Yeah. I do have one more question yeah. if there's time. So I I think healthcare is so interesting as a business because it's like inevitably kind of a grudge purchase. Like I don't think anybody wakes up and says, I want to pay for, you know, a cast for my broken leg today. But it's also not a business where we like, uh, we want repeat customers because that means that like something's wrong. And so I just wonder if like you've ever thought similarly and wonder how we can like frame our services. Like there's probably always going to be people who need us, but I just think those two factors really make this a distinct business model. Yeah, it's it's where the incentives don't always seem aligned. And it's actually really interesting. Um, you should go and look at some of the reporting that was done when the Affordable Care Act was coming out. Hospitals were really against sometimes of the Affordable Care Act, especially the readmission costs. Um, and so they, because they felt that, right, if there was incentive to reduce readmissions, there would be less people coming to the hospital. So they were concerned that they were going to have to close, that they were going to have to do all these things. And instead they started talking about, well, well, you know, you're kind of already overwhelmed now. If there's fewer people coming to the hospital who don't need that care, that's a good thing, right? So then you can actually focus your resources on the people who do really need you. I mean, and we see that even now, like there's wait lists, there's all sorts of things for care. So people do have trouble getting access. And so it's kind of that rethinking of, you know, well, we're not going to have as many patients, but how can we then provide better care to the people who need it? And maybe we can actually provide them with the appropriate number of visits. But it's something that I've thought about in healthcare and even thinking about reimbursement, and I hope to look into it further of like, has reimbursement kind of stripped therapy of its value? You know, when in home health, for example, because of how PDGM is structured and home health losing money, they've tried to reduce therapy to like one to three visits. Well, how are you supposed to show that therapy is useful if we only have two times to provide an intervention? If you look at like a stroke rehab protocol, right, based on research, it's like three, three months of repetitive interventions. But you, where do you get that, right? You're not getting it in inpatient rehab. You're not getting it in SNF. You're just kind of hoping that the next therapist carries it on. So I think that's really interesting too, is like looking at has reimbursement trained therapy to be lower value, but then has it also made it difficult to show the value that we do have when we aren't given enough opportunity to actually provide evidence-based protocols? So I think it's a really, a really interesting dynamic that doesn't have an easy answer. Because yeah, how do you how do you demonstrate value if you only see a patient a couple times? It's really challenging.